They make up 42.8% of the carbonated beverages market in the United States. 3.1% of all the world's beverages are consumed from within their brand. Yet, only about 15.4% of Coca-Cola's revenue comes from North America. To say that the brand is international is practically an understatement. Coca-Cola is everywhere. Well, almost everywhere. Despite selling 1.9 billion servings of Coke a day, none of those are reaching Cuba and North Korea, the only two countries that Coke is not allowed to sell to because of long-term U.S. trade embargoes put in place for… reasons. But Coca-Cola wasn't always so global. In fact, when it began, it was more of a street corner type business. The product that has given the world its best known taste was born in Atlanta, Georgia on May 8, 1886. Dr. John Stith Pemberton, a local pharmacist and former Confederate colonel in the Civil War, produced the syrup for Coca-Cola and carried a jug of the new product down the street to Jacob's Pharmacy, where it was sampled, pronounced excellent, and placed on sale for five cents a glass as a soda fountain drink. Carbonated water was teamed with the new syrup to produce a drink that was at once delicious and refreshing, a theme that continues to echo today whenever Coca-Cola is enjoyed. Thinking that the two C's would look good in advertising, Dr. Pemberton's partner and bookkeeper Frank M. Robinson suggested the name and pinned the now-famous trademark Coca-Cola in its unique cursive script. The first newspaper ad for Coca-Cola soon appeared in the Atlanta Journal, inviting thirsty citizens to try the new and popular soda fountain drink, Hand-painted oilcloth signs reading Coca-Cola appeared on store awnings with the suggestion drink, added to inform passers-by that the new beverage was for soda fountain refreshment. During the first year, sales averaged a modest nine drinks per day, a far cry from their modern numbers. Around 1903, as they were making the decision to remove cocaine from the drink, they were also looking to expand beyond the local pharmacies. They signed licensing agreements for bottling plants in Dallas, Los Angeles, and Philadelphia. In 1890, about 9,000 gallons of the syrup used to make the drinks were sold, but just 10 years later that number was up to over 370,000 gallons. It wasn't long before the drink was being sold in every U.S. state and territory. The company decided that it needed to find a new market to sell this sugary drink to, and for that, they first found America's youth. They needed help relating to a younger generation, and thus turned to a man that always seemed to know exactly what the children wanted. A man who at the time sometimes appeared as tall and gaunt, or as a short elf. Yep, they called in Santa Claus. And they gave him a makeover too. By 1931, the man from the North Pole was working for Coke in their advertising department, getting a makeover with a nice red and white suit matching the Coca-Cola brand, and being presented as a big jolly fellow. But soon they found themselves with many men, women, and children consuming their drink, but they were all American they decided to make the jump across borders into as many countries as they could. The eldest son of the company founder, Asa Candler, who had bought the company from Pemberton in 1887, took the first jug of syrup to London in 1900. However, it would be a few decades before the drink actually got its foothold outside of the United States. It wasn't until 1919, after the end of World War I, that the first local European bottling agreement was signed. Yet, Globalization of the brand, or coca colonization as it would eventually be called, was always a goal for the company. In fact, part of the reason why many different elements of the Coca-Cola business were standardized, such as uniforms, colors, and the recipe, was an anticipation of expanding the business worldwide and ensuring a consistent universal experience. Expanding the Coca-Cola business beyond the shores of North America was of particular importance to Robert Woodruff, when he became the president of the company in 1923. He opened what was named the Foreign Department in 1926 out of New York, which then eventually became the Coca-Cola Export Corporation. The board of directors were eager to expand the business and gave Woodruff permission to explore local operations almost anywhere in the world. But let's take a break for a moment before we get to the point where everything takes off for the company. I want to talk about the price of the drink. Because Coca-Cola is particularly unusual in how it's been priced since its conception. While it's not uncommon for a startup to offer a lower price to drum up a consumer base and then charge a higher price once they've become hooked on the product, Coca-Cola was ridiculously cheap for a very long time. In 1886, if you walked into one of the pharmacies Coke was being sold in and got it from the fountain, you would be charged 5 cents. To give some reference, that was a little bit on the cheap side even for the time, as some fountain drinks would run you 7 to 10 cents. But say you wanted to get a drink in 1920, 
you go and buy one of their classic glass bottles, it would cost you five cents. Okay, but what if you wanted to celebrate World War II ending in 1945 by drinking a refreshing cold Coke? Can you take a guess at how much it would cost? Five cents. In fact, from 1886 to 1959, whether you purchased it at a fountain or in a bottle, 6.5 ounces of Coke would cost you just a nickel. The reason it was just five cents for so long goes back to Coke not getting its lawyers to read a contract before signing it, and then resulted in a somewhat petty back and forth between the company and their bottlers for about 70 years straight. It's actually a very interesting story, and if you would like me to cover it in its entirety, then leave a like and comment below. But, getting back into our timeline, in the 1920s and 30s, Coke was desperately trying to get through to Europe and the rest of the world, but it needed just a little more of a push to get there. Then World War II happened. Americans had joined the conflict and the military was looking for ways to keep morale high as people were fighting in one of the most horrific wars in human history. When U.S. Army General Dwight D. Eisenhower saw the early success of bottling plants Coke had established prior to World War II, he sent a pressing telegram from his allied headquarters in North Africa addressed to Coca-Cola's headquarters in Atlanta. Dated June 29, 1943, his request to the company included 10 portable factories, 6 million filled bottles of Coke a month, and materials and resources to provide American GIs with the refreshingly cool and crisp suds that he hoped would increase their spirits with every sip. Eisenhower himself was a casual Coke drinker and jumped at the chance to bring to life the 1941 promise of Coca-Cola's president, Robert Woodruff. Woodruff wanted to see that every man in uniform gets a bottle of Coca-Cola for five cents, wherever he is and whatever it costs the company. But there was a problem. Vital equipment, gear, and food for survival packed the cargo decks and rooms aboard supply ships. Every inch of space was methodically prepared for the expedition overseas to participate in the war effort. Anything that wasn't used for survival, or that didn't shoot, blow up, drive, or fly, was viewed as non-essential and that included crates of Coke. When Eisenhower's plea was received by high-level executives from Coca-Cola, they started devising a plan to bring distribution of the soft drink to combat areas. They came to the conclusion that having the bottling plants on the war side of the Atlantic Ocean would be much more efficient. Six months following the original message, a Coca-Cola representative flew to Algiers, the capital of Algeria, to implement the paper plants into actionable construction of the first bottling plant. Eisenhower had anticipated only 10 plants would be sufficient, but to his surprise, 64 bottling lines were erected by the war's end. Soon, 148 representatives from Coke filled the ranks with the official title of Technical Observers, also known as TOs. The TOs were given army fatigues, treated like commissioned officers, and had one responsibility, to serve Coke to every American GI, no matter where they were located. Their reputation spread as they deployed from North Africa to the Pacific and European theaters of war. Americans slung their rifles over their shoulders and welcomed the TOs without prejudice. Their inclusion into these units earned them the nicknames Coca-Cola Colonels, and they worked tireless days, two of which returned home in flag-draped caskets. The soldiers themselves were grateful for the drink, as it reminded them of home. The Coca-Cola Colonels brought the fizzy drink to the front lines and to nearby aid stations. Foxholes and dug-in positions once absent of smiles were replaced with toasts to one day making it back home. Soldiers who were located in remote locations didn't miss out on what their comrades around the world were enjoying either. The TOs had a plan for them too. Their reach expanded far beyond the war zones, into Iceland, Newfoundland, Panama, anywhere Americans were deployed, a Coke and a TO were close by. By the end of World War II, over 5 billion bottles had been distributed to those in uniform and Coca-Cola took all of those temporary wartime plants and transformed them into fully operational facilities. The war had allowed them to expand their company infrastructure to every corner of the globe. Thank you for watching Learn Something New. This was a really interesting episode to research, and it led me to come across the fact mentioned earlier that Coke's price hadn't changed for the first 73 years of its operation. If you would like me to make another video going deeper into that story of why it was such a low price, how they regained control of their pricing structure, and the many complications that it brought the company, leave a like or comment down below. As always, thank you, and see you next time.